Welcome, everyone. Welcome to When a Doctor Becomes a Patient with Dr. Susan Love. My name is Christine Benjamin, and I'm the Breast Cancer Program Director at SHARE. Before the presentation begins, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about SHARE. SHARE is a 37-year-old nonprofit organization that helps people through breast or ovarian cancer, offering the unique support of survivors who've been there. Our services are free of charge and include helplines, support groups, educational programs, and public health initiatives. For more information and to learn about our upcoming programs, visit our website at www.sharecancersupport.org. So let me tell you a little bit about the format of this program and how you can participate. All participants will be muted so that we can all clearly hear the presenter. If you have a question during or after the presentation, please submit the question through the question pane in your control panel. You can access the question pane by clicking on the red arrow in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. When the presentation is over, we'll open up for questions. I'll field the questions and read them to Dr. Love, and then she will answer them. So let me introduce Dr. Love. Dr. Susan Love who has dedicated her professional life to the eradication of breast cancer, is the chief visionary officer of the Dr. Susan Love Research Foundation. A former breast surgeon, Dr. Love is best known as a trusted guide to women worldwide through her book, Dr. Susan's, Susan Love's Breast Book, also called the Breast Cancer Bible. I just added that in, she didn't, just for the record, she didn't put that in her bio. Her activist reputation comes from her role as one of the founding mothers of the breast cancer advocacy movement in the early 1990s and is one of the founders of the National Breast Cancer Coalition. Please welcome Dr. Susan Love. Thank you, Dr. Love, and thanks for being with us. Thank you very much. It's really great to be with you. It's great to be here, actually, um, as the as the title of this talk suggests, um, I've had an eventful um, last year and a half and um, am happy to be back in, in the saddle um, giving talks about breast cancer. Let me tell you, it's a, it's a welcome relief. Um, you know, when I think back of my experience in the last year and a half, um, one thing really comes to mind, I was, it was spring of um, 2012, uh, uh, I guess. Uh, are we 13? Yeah, 2012. Um, and I was at a conference in San Francisco, the SAGE conference, and it was a lot of researchers and, and um, some pharmaceutical people, uh, very few, some advocates, but not a lot, and everybody talking about big data and the latest new thing and how everything was going to change. And they kept talking about researchers and, and one pool and then the patients and it was they were like two different completely different groups and I was getting more and more annoyed and I had a, a chance they had a sort of you know almost Ted Med kind of thing in the evening everybody they had a reception and they had drinks and they had hors d'oeuvres and then they had people you know got five minutes to speak their piece and I got up and said the only difference between a researcher and a patient is a diagnosis. And that we arbitrarily you know, put people in two different camps, but we're really not in two different camps. We're all in this together. And one day you could be a researcher, and the next day you could be a patient. And then you could be a researcher again. But that this arbitrary differentiation um, really isn't valid. Well, people liked it. It was interesting. The patients, of course, particularly liked it more than the researchers who don't who like to think if they do research, they won't get a disease. Um, and it doesn't work that way. Uh, but uh, a few months later, I was um, out for a run the night um, on the beach. And the next day, I went from my office to UCLA to see my primary care doctor, for, or my actually rheumatologist for a routine exam because she was going to be retiring and I wanted her to refer me to somebody else. And she took blood tests like she always did. And I went back to the office and two hours later I got a phone call from my primary care doctor saying, I have shocking news for you. 
you have you know, 30% blasts in your blood, come back right now to UCLA. We'll do a bone marrow biopsy and see if you have leukemia. Um, well, needless to say, uh, my life changed in a, in a second. I could barely remember what leukemia was. I mean, it certainly wasn't breast cancer. Um, uh, and you didn't operate for it, so that didn't help me. And I drove back and had the biopsy, and lo and behold, I did have acute myelogenous leukemia, which is the, the more, most aggressive of the leukemias. Um, luckily, because I was asymptomatic, they gave me a little bit of time, and so I could get second opinions. And, and talk to people I knew. And within, though, 10 days, I was in the hospital on chemo and uh, spent seven weeks in the hospital and then um, ha got a bone marrow transplant from my younger sister. Um, luckily, she's 12 years younger, so I have new young blood, um, new energy, <laughs> and uh, hopefully that'll contain me. And since then, I've been recovering. And at the moment, 15 months later, I am doing well. Um, as we all know, you, we only know about the moment. So uh, the next moment could change everything, but right now everything's cool, and I'll take it. Um, I, I really did learn a lot of lessons in this process, um, lessons about the process, and then lessons really about um, the consequences of being a patient and the, the limitations of the medical profession. Um, for one, I, I certainly learned that um, how important my family was, and they were terrific. Um, I grew up partly in Mexico, and there, if someone's in the hospital, you always have a family member in the room with them. Um, I think it's protection from the hospital. But nonetheless, my family rallied around. My siblings took 24-hour shifts. My daughter was there at night. My wife was there during the day. And, and I was really rarely, if ever, alone in the hospital. And that's important because one of the things I think that happens when you're a patient, and even when you're a physician patient, is that you, you sort of regress to being a good little girl, and you don't want to make the doctors mad at you, and you want to keep everybody happy so they'll take good care of you, so you don't want to complain. And half the time, you don't even tell them what is wrong with you. I mean, my family would give me a hard time because I'd be, have, you know, terrible pain from neuropathy, and the doctors would come in and say, how are you? And I'd say, oh, fine. You know, and they'd say, wait a minute, you're not fine. You've been, you know, complaining for days. So having advocates, having ex an external team with you, I think I learned is even more critical than I thought. Another lesson that I learned was that, um, how to think about, it just reminded me how to think about statistics. Because whenever anybody is diagnosed with cancer, or, or for that matter, any serious disease, you know, you immediately want to know, okay, what are the odds? What are the odds I'm going to make it versus not make it? And while it's important to know that, to sort of get a sense of, is this something serious or is it not, um, they really don't tell you very much about what's going to happen to you. Because whatever happens to you is 100%. If 99% of people die, but you live, you're still alive. Um, and if 99% of people live, but you die, you're the unfortunate one, you're dead. So whatever happens to you is really a 100% thing. So it, it's good to know the statistics, to sort of know, is this serious or not? Should I you know, get my will in order and that stuff, or, um, and be prepared? But apart from that you then just have to let the statistics go and live your life every day because we we never know what's going to happen and we never know when when our day is going to change from one day to the next the other other lesson i learned was about research i mean being a physician do, uh, patient i could go online and search the literature and 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 look at all the the studies that have been done about leukemia and try and and my wife would tease me that I was looking for the paper that said this is Susan loves leukemia and this is what's going to happen <laughs> and that's exactly what I was looking for and I never found it because they're never exactly like you and so you read in the paper about these studies I post them on Facebook and Twitter for people and and you're always as a patient trying to see how does this fit me and it never quite fits your unique case and that goes back to, you know, whatever happens to you happens to you. You are unique. So you can only 
deal with your own situation, your own body, and your own disease. And you have to be really careful about not either getting overly depressed or optimistic or anything by, by what data that is really more generic um, and may or may not uh, apply to you. Um, whatever happens to you happens to you, and you just we just have to learn. And I think it's a good lesson for everybody, not just those who have had a potentially life-threatening diagnosis, but that you know every day is a gift, and this is what we got, and you play it as best you can, and hope you get another one tomorrow. Um, and we never know. We just never know. So I, I ended up a lot more um, uh, philosophical about about that uh, part of it and, and I think a little bit more comfortable about it um, from having gone through the experience. But on the other side of it, I ended up a lot more impatient and angry. And that's particularly um, in the breast cancer world. I have, a, a, as was said, spent my whole career um, working on breast cancer uh, as a doctor, as a surgeon, as an as a advocate, as an author, um, helping um, and share with Zara from the beginning, actually, uh, helping launch the National Breast Cancer Coalition and really was the, the most vocal, the first really vocal um, uh, breast cancer uh, advocacy movement and, and um, back in the early 90s. Um, but, you know, when I look at where things are now, I'm really angry because for all these years, We've made a lot of progress. You know, we, we now have awareness, God knows. When the NFL is wearing pink, then you know that we've, we've achieved awareness. But, um, but in fact, what we haven't done um, is change things that much. We have a pink tsunami. It's no longer untouchable. When we started, no company wanted to talk about breast cancer because they were afraid people would think they would catch it from, you know, eating their yogurt or wearing their cosmetics. And now, um, you know, everybody's doing pink. And and and, but there's there's no there's no unified effort. There's no there there. We got we've gotten awareness. We've got we've got support, but we still don't know. Here, wait a minute with my. Um, no, um, the answers that really people need, and this was really brought to to the fore for me in the last month. I had two within two days. I was traveling in Boston, and and I met an old patient of mine that I had operated on thirty twenty years ago. She had DCIS. I, I tried to get clean margins with a lumpectomy. I couldn't. She ended up with a mastectomy. She's fine. She's still around. But you know what? If she came to me today, we would do the same thing. We haven't made any progress. We haven't figured out which DCIS is going to become bad and which isn't. We haven't figured out how to treat it short of cutting the whole breast off, which is a, a bit excessive um, for something that isn't even cancer. Um, we haven't figured out what causes it in the first place. We haven't done any of that. We're still doing the same old thing we did 20 years ago. And then I got a call from a young woman who was a friend of a friend. She had had breast cancer. And uh, then she got, afterwards, her treatment, she was doing fine. She got pregnant she had tw with twins. Um, and her breast cancer came back in, in the treated breast. Um, so she had a local recurrence. They couldn't do the test to figure out if there were any metastases, of course, because she was pregnant. And nobody knew what to do. We don't know. Should We really don't know should she terminate the pregnancies or not. We think it probably doesn't matter, but nobody knows. We really don't know the best way to treat it. We really don't know how the pregnancy interacted with the breast cancer. And that's, again, we didn't know it 30 years ago, but we have no idea now either. And I really don't know what to tell her. And she's in this really bad position of trying to decide what to do. And, and that's crazy. Why haven't we made more progress? We have made some. You know, we've got Herceptin now and that. And so when I started, if you had HER2 new, what, what turned out to be HER2 new positive breast cancer, you know, that was almost a death sentence. They did really badly. And now that people do much better and we now have other her two new kinds of drugs, so that's really great. So that's better. That is some improvement. 
um, we've got some new hormonal drugs that can, whereas in the old days we just would automatically take your ovaries out if you had estrogen positive cancer, we now have drugs that, that, that can help in that arena. Um, so that's good. We can test for the gene. We didn't have the gene back until the early, either sort of, I think, 1993 or 4. So that can help predict for some people why they have a strong family history of breast cancer. But, you know, and the surgery is a little bit better, although I don't know, we're sort of wafting back towards bilateral mastectomies after we fought so hard for breast conservation. But really, women are dying at the same rate they were dying before. And the early detection in the 1950s with mammography, we showed early detection could improve your chances of getting uh, of dying of breast cancer by 25 percent. And today, with the best digital fancy dancing mammography, with MRI, with ultrasound, throwing everything we got at it, we can improve the survival by 25 percent. So it turns out that the idea that early detection was going to be the answer and we just find all cancers early and, and cure them, not true that the biology of the cancer is more important than when you find it. That 25% of cancers are, you can find at a, on, by using imaging at a point where you can make a difference in the outcome. And the rest of them are either so aggressive they've already spread by the time you find them, or so slow growing they were never going to spread anyway. So we really haven't, beyond that, made much more progress. We're, we, we need to, we really need to sort of reinvigorate things, I think, and, and, and change um, how we're doing it. Now, if you look at the breast cancer advocacy movement, what you see is, is too many groups. <laughs> you know, there were no groups, and nobody paid attention to anything, and now there's a million groups. Um, if you go on Facebook, there's at least two male groups, there's three metastatic groups, there's her two new groups, there's triple negative groups, there's Latina groups, there's young groups, and there's young triple negative groups, and there's, I mean, and, and you all uh, who are listening know this, that there's, there's, you can slice and dice it a million different ways, but there are a million different groups, and in some ways, that dilutes our efforts. It makes us into competitors instead of really trying to find the answers so that we can find what causes breast cancer and end it. I mean, we really have to find at least, it doesn't mean that these groups are not valuable in terms of support and, and sharing experiences. I think they are. I think they're, they're magnificent in that regard. But I think that we have to be able to, I don't know, maybe to, to have some issues where we can all work together. Whereas rather than being competitive um, for membership, for money, for attention, we can actually say, on these issues, we'll all work together, and on these other issues, you know, our particular issues, we, you know, we, we'll, we'll do our separate things. Because otherwise, we're never going to move forward. So we decided, my impatience and, and anger and, and, and feelings got channeled um, this October into saying, okay, so I got to be, you know, I, I can't wait. I, I, who knows how much time I got? Um, and so we're going to move forward. And I reached out to um, the Young Survival Coalition, to the Coleman Foundation, and said, let's work together on one project. Um, we're not going to, you know, sell our soul. We're not going to, you know, uh, merge. We're just going to find one project that we can work together on. And the project I thought about was collateral damage. The, because the other big message I got from my treatment was that it wasn't so great, that the chemo cause, causes numb feet, neuropathy, chemo brain, and that's just the beginning. And what happens is we don't talk about the price we pay because we're good girls and we're, we feel like we're lucky to be alive and we shouldn't complain and make people feel bad. And the doctors they don't ask about the collateral damage of treatment because, you know what, they don't want to know. They, they compare you to the people who died, and they say, mm, lucky to be alive. Um, and so why are you complaining? All you've got is numb toes, um, or your brain doesn't work right. You know, what are you complaining about? And they also, when I talk to the doctors, say the other reason they don't ask is because they don't want to know about things they can't fix. 
So they don't want you to tell them things that they don't have an answer for. So if you say, I have chemo brain and they don't know what to do for it, or, or I've lost my libido and they don't know what to do for it, they don't want to hear it because they like to feel like they have something to offer you and they can help you. So they don't ask. So it's don't ask, don't tell. And then it's not in the electronic medical record. You know, there's all these people who think if we just collect all these electronic medical records, we're going to have the answer of all life's problems. But the problem with that is the only thing that's in the medical record is enough information for me to bill and enough information so I don't get sued. Um, that's the purpose of the medical record. It's not to document your, you know, how you, you responded to the treatment. It's not even to doc, and it's certainly not to document the collateral damage. And, and then you've got the drug companies. Their, their studies are, they need very pure populations for their studies. So when they're going to test a new drug, they want people who don't have any other diseases, aren't taking any other drugs, just have this one thing, and they're going to follow you for six months. So they don't find out the long-term consequences. They only find out the really big glaring ones that they can't, that they can't avoid, and they don't really want to know either. Um, uh, they want to get the drug out to market, sell it as long as they can before they, you know, they have to pull it because it causes, I don't know, ingrown toenails on Thursdays. Um, but nonetheless, they, they're, they're not looking for it either. So nobody really is looking at the collateral damage. So it's going to have to be us. We're going to have to do it. We got to talk about it. It's got to be the people who are actually experiencing it. So we're going out to the public and we're asking everybody to give us their collateral damage, to give us what is the unspoken cost of the cure, what, is the, what are we experiencing that we haven't been talking about, what would we wish is different. Because the only way we're going to get people to focus on finding the cause of breast cancer and ending it, I think, is to show that having it and being treated is not a pink you know, celebration, it really has true cost to your body, to your brain, and your pocketbook. And it would be much better not to get it in the first place. So we put it out in the beginning of October. Cher was one of our partners um, as well on this, the National Breast Cancer Coalition, Latinas Contra Cancer, many, as many advocacy groups as I could reach out to. Um, and we're asking people to give us their experiences, their questions, um, their, and, and what they think should be studied. And we're putting it together um, for our Health of Women study, which I'll tell you about in a second. And then we'll be able to report back to the medical profession and the, the, well, back to you what these are. And you'll find out whether what you have is common, not common, um, or not. When we first put it out, we got within 24 hours 3,000 responses and people saying, thank God nobody ever asked before. Um, you know, nobody's ever mentioned this before. And, and it was really quite remarkable. Many of the, of the collateral damage um, issues we've heard about were things that I, you know, that everybody knows, lymphedema, um, chemo brain, fatigue, um, depression, neuropathy. But there are a lot of ones that I've never heard of before that may really be real. I mean, people talking from on Herceptin about having continual running noses. Well, you know, that's one of the ones that doctors would say, eh, you know, who cares? It's just a runny nose. But it really does interfere with your life if your nose is dripping all the time. I mean, it's not a, it's not a, little, a little consequence. Um, and it would be important to know whether that really is a side effect or not. And then lots of people talking about also things like, when is, are, is my sensation going to come back after a mastectomy? Well, you know what? It never comes back. Because the way the mastectomy is done or the, is that we, you, you undermine the skin, and that cuts all the nerves to the skin. So it doesn't grow back. Now, what happens is I don't, either the doctors didn't tell them in the first place or they didn't hear it. But, and then when you complain to the doctor half the time, they say, oh, well, give it time, hoping you'll forget about it. Um, not, but in fact, it doesn't come back. And somebody needs to say that in the beginning. I, I've yelled at plastic surgeons who have said to me, that they say to the patient, we'll make you new breasts, and they'll look normal, and they'll feel normal. 
they mean to the feeler, not to the feelee, who won't feel normal at all. I mean, they don't tell you about phantom nipples or, it, or, or all these other um, neurological symptoms you can get from the surgery. They don't tell you that after a lumpectomy, your breasts may get hard or swollen, or you might get muscle cramps from the radiation. They don't, all of these things are not documented and not told, and you won't find them in the literature because nobody's ever asked. And now it's time for us to take it in our own hands and just tell them. Um, and, and maybe by doing that, we can get things better. We have to stop being good little girls and start being impatient, angry women um, and, and really change this. Now, at the Dr. Susan Love Research Foundation, we have a, a way to collect all of this. We have the Health of Women study. And I encourage all of you to join if you haven't already. And what the Health of Women study is, is a series of questionnaires over time. Sort of like you've heard about the Nurses' Health Study or the California Teachers Study, where they track people over time. Well, we're tracking both women with breast cancer and healthy women. So, because we have to have somebody to compare to. If you just have the women with breast cancer, you don't know whether the, the problems are because of the breast cancer or whether the problems are because of, the, uh, of their age or whatever else. So you need both. And we're going to track them over time. We've had two series of questionnaires so far, so you can catch up. If, you, if you're just joining now. And we're going to follow you over the next 20 years. And this, we're looking particularly for hints to the cause of breast cancer, hints to things that people haven't thought about before, as well as hints to why some people who should have died survive and don't, and do. I mean, you know, we always look at the people who die and try to figure out how to predict who's going to die. But there are people who have all the signs that pr would predict they're going to die, and they don't. What are they doing differently? There are secrets there that all of us could benefit from. So we're looking both at survivors, at collateral damage, and at trying to figure out the cause so we can uh, prevent it in the first place. Um, so you can go, uh, you can sign up for the house study, and as part of the house study, we'll have this collateral damage questionnaire in the spring that will document the cost of, of breast cancer um, among all of you in a way that we can tell people. Um, we have lots of groups working with us, as I said, Living Beyond Breast Cancer, SHARE, and it's something that I think everybody can get involved in. It, you, you know, it's not, it doesn't, it, it's something we can all work together on and nobody needs to have ownership of, and it can be a good example of how we can get all the breast cancer organizations to work together to really make significant change. We just have to take it into our own hands. So far we have more than 3,300 questions. More than 1,000 a, a new people have signed up for HOW, and I hope after this call, which allegedly has 130 women listening, I'm going to look on the ticker on the HOW site and see if I have 130 more members. So I'm checking up on you. Now, within the next year, we hope we're going to continue to crowdsource the science. Because the great thing about the HOW study um, is that you can tell us what questions you think we should ask, not only about collateral damage, but about other things. We're going to see what myths about breast cancer would you like to see answered. What other study things do you think we should look into? What are the things you think might have caused cancer? Now, you know, when you think about it, and my example always in, in, in this, and what drives me in my impatience and makes me think that, this is, that finding the cause of breast cancer and ending it is a doable thing, is cancer of the cervix. And all of you out there who are over, who are my age in my 60s, um, know that when we were young, if you had an abnormal pap smear, just an abnormal pap smear, you had a total hysterectomy because we didn't know what else to do. And I have a cousin who had an abnormal pap smear. They wanted to do a hysterectomy, and she wasn't married. She really wanted to have kids. They told her, you have a year. She lived in New York, actually. Um, ran out, found somebody, got married, had a kid, and then a year later, right after the kid was born, they did the hysterectomy. Needless to say, she ultimately divorced him. But um, <laughs> I don't think it was that far out. But it <laughs> did serve her purpose. Um, but and then and then we figured out the cancer of the cervix was actually sexually transmitted. Now that kind of observation could come from anybody. You don't need to be a scientist. In fact, I've been told that the first clues 
were people who noticed that, this, that there are these guys and their first wife died of cancer of the cervix and then their second wife died of cancer of the cervix. And people started saying, hmm, maybe there's something about him. And indeed there was. He was sexually transmitting the HPV virus. But that started people looking for what could be sexually transmitted. Then from there, they figured out that it was sexually transmitted. And indeed that, you know, prostitutes have more breast cancer, I mean more cancer of the cervix um, than nuns. Uh, and that was another clue um, that maybe it was sexually transmitted. And then they figured out it was an H HPV, and then they figured out it was a virus, and lo and behold, we now have a vaccine. How cool is that? So my daughter will never get cancer of the cervix. And it's not just cancer of the cervix. It's turning out that head and neck cancers are also caused, a lot of them by HPV, again, sexually transmitted, anal cancers. You know, we're, we tend to be kind of prudish in this, in this society, and we pretend that, you know, sex is all in the missionary position and only one way, but in fact, we do transmit those sexually transmitted viruses lots of different ways and they cause problems lots of different ways. So by vaccinating people, we not only will prevent cancer of the cervix, but a lot of head and neck cancer, a lot of anal cancers, and our, our, the next generation will grow up not knowing about that disease. Well, if we can do that in our lifetime, those of us that are old enough, for cancer of the cervix, why can't we do it for cancer of the breast? I mean, there's no reason we can't. It doesn't have to always be with us. Could cancer of the breast be a virus? Sure. We have to look. And there are some people looking, uh, but not a lot. I mean, most of the research money is can we find targeted you know, treatments and how can we make more money and not what's the cause, how can we prevent it? I went to a meeting of the American Association of Cancer Researchers last year before last, before I got sick, and they had, there were five plenary lectures. Four of them were about how we're going to harness the immune system to, to, to deal with cancer, and the fifth one was um, about the HPV vaccine. When they got up to talk about the HPV vaccine, all the scientists got up and walked out, because you can't get rich on that, and you can get rich on a new Herceptin or a new drug. So we have to drive this. But we can drive it. We can come up with the questions. We can figure out. Maybe it is back. Maybe it is infectious. We're doing some research at the Dr. Susan Love Research Foundation, actually, in collaboration, looking for what I call bugs in the breast. You know, here you have an organ that gets sucked on by lovers and babies, and it probably has bacteria in it. It probably has, you know, viruses in it. And could one of them be the culprit? Or could they, you know, be doing something else? We don't know, and we won't know until we look. So we really, I think we've got to get everybody together. We've got to um, work in collaboration, at least on particular projects. And we've got to document the cost of the cure and focus on finding the cause. Because we can be the generation that ends breast cancer. And wouldn't that be great if our if our children never have to know about breast cancer, isn't that what we really all want? Um, and so I, I, I really invite you all, join the House study, join the, the Army of Women, join the NBCC deadline 2020, do everything you can. We're not, none of us are in competition. We're all working to the same goal, to find the end of breast cancer and go on to something totally more interesting. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Love. Got some, uh, just a few questions here. So the first question is, um, how often or what, what percentage does AML occur as collateral damage because mm. of breast cancer treatment? Good question. And the, it, it does occur as collateral damage of breast cancer treatment. And in fact, uh, Robin Roberts' uh, myelodysplasia, which is sort of the DCIS of AML, um, came from her breast cancer treatment. She's sort of the poster child of that. But um, we don't know exactly the percentage. 
Um, and it's one of the things I'm hoping to be able to document. In fact, I've been in some conversations, not just collaborating within breast cancer, but I'm talking to the Le Leukemia and Lymphoma Society because they're interested in how often AML is secondary to breast cancer chemo. And then we're talking to the neuropathy people because they're interested in, how, in the neuropathy caused by chemo. So we don't even have to just collaborate within breast cancer. We can also collaborate across the different disease foundations to try to, to, to solve some of these problems. It's not high, the leukemia rate. It's in the order of, you know, 5 or 10 percent, not the order of 30 or 40 percent. But it is real, and it does happen. OK, another know, question. OK, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I can say I know there's a lot that a lot of you have other questions you're dying to ask. So this is your chance. I'm here ready to answer whatever you want. It doesn't even have to be about the talk. OK. Um. So someone says, I asked you about a year ago about the loss of libido with stage 4 cancer. You answered you need to do things to get yourself in the mood. Has your outlook changed since your diagnosis and treatment? Um, you know, it, libido is very complicated. Uh, and um, it's because there's so many different elements that go into it. Um, some of them biological and some of them psychological. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and so it's very hard to dissect. But I will say that in our collateral damage project, we're finding that problems with libido are, are huge um, among uh, breast cancer survivors. And I think it is something that, that we're going to need to, to um, research more and think about more and also help people ahead of time. I mean, if you're in a situation where you may or may not need chemo and you're sort of get a choice, not everybody does, but if you get a choice, you, that might make a difference to you. Now, some of the libido problems are being put into premature menopause abruptly. Some of them are caused by the drugs. Some of them are, they're complicated. Some of them are caused by uh, feeling different about your body or having your body respond differently. People who got most of their sexual stimulation from their breasts and then have either artificial breasts or, or, or numb nipples or whatever, that, that can be a problem for libido. So it's a really, it turns out to be a very complex, much more complex situation uh, <laughs> than we've given it credit for. And I think we need to, and one of the nice things about doing this collateral damage project in the house study is that um, we will, the house study also collects information from you about your breast cancer and what treatments you got and what other drugs you're taking and that stuff. So we'll be able to, uh, it's not just, you know, X percent have libido problems and X don't, but we'll, we will be able to slice and dice it in a way where we can say, you know, X percent of people on this drug who had this surgery have this problem. And maybe that will help us get some insights. I'm hoping that we'll be able to even find some other hints, like maybe um, people who have, you know, Restless leg syndrome have more neuropathy, or I just made that up. Um, but you know, looking uh, not just at the collateral damage, but looking across the person's health, family history, other issues to see if we can find hints. Because sometimes there are very simple ways that you can fix it. For example, recently there was an article. This isn't the libido, but it's an example of how the the collateral damage can be avoided sometimes very simply. That showed that if you gave uh, Herceptin with adriamycin sequentially, instead of at the same time, you had much, much less cardiotox cardiotoxicity. Well, that's really easy. It means instead of just giving the drugs together, you give them separately. Well, you know, that, just think of the, the benefits of that. So we're looking for not just documenting, but are there clues? And we'll even be asking people, what have they done that helped? Because there may be some really answers out there that some of you have come up with that work for you, that sharing them with the broader population um, could be, you know, save them a lot of agony. So, uh, yeah, I probably, I'm sure I was more dismissive of most collateral damage prior to being sick than I am now. And I, you know, I, I attribute that from coming more from a doctor position uh, than a patient position. And, and I fully admit that that was wrong. So, mea culpa. <laughs> So one participant says, how can one individual 
work to push for a cure. Which organization is the most focused on pushing pharma for the real solutions? So the question, you know, the, this is really a, um, an interesting question. I think that we don't, I don't think there's anybody right now. So um, I think that uh, Coleman is in the middle of really a big reorg. They have a new CEO who's really, I've met, she's, she's, a, she's a doctor, she's um, uh, worked in, as a scientist, she's really good. And I expect to see some really good things from, from them in the future and a sort of shift maybe in some of in their, in their focus. Um, but they're not currently doing that. The, you've, got the, you've got the NIH, and the, they're all working on drugs. Um, my worry is that a lot of the in thing right now is um, what they call targeted therapies. So after the success of Herceptin, where you had a drug that could, you know, specifically block the, the thing that was overexpressed in the HER2 new, the epidermal growth factor that was over overexpressed in HER2 new positive cancer, everybody said, well, we're going to figure out all these different kinds of cancers and we're going to make drugs that specifically block that one mutation. And it, it really sounded great. However, what we found and what's been really all over the science news in the last year is how cancers, different parts of cancers have different defects, that they're heterogeneous. So you could have been ER positive with your original cancer and then you could get metastatic disease that's ER negative. Or you could get metastatic disease that's HER2 positive. So just because you start out one way, there are different communities of cells within your, within your tumor. And when you take a treatment to, to, to decrease the dominant one, then some of the less dominant ones arise because there's nobody keeping them down. And, and, uh, and so it's more complex than we had thought And this idea that we'll just have personalized medicine, I think you're going to see go by the boards. And, and that's why more people are focusing now on maybe looking at, you know, in order to have cancer, you need mutated cells, and they need to be in a neighborhood that's egging them on. So if you could change the neighborhood, maybe by the immune system, maybe by, you know, some kind of vaccine, maybe that to make the cells dormant so they go to sleep, then if you could live your whole lifetime with dormant breast cancer cells and die of a stroke at 110, you really don't care if you have those breast cancer cells if they're dormant. You only care if they're acting up and giving you a problem. So there is a lot of emphasis, and NBCC, National Breast Cancer Coalition, is looking at a project of how to, you know, how to control or make cells dormant, which may be well away. I mean, cure is a funny word. It, it, it really means you... I guess you die without having active breast cancer. But you could die with having asleep breast cancer cells and be considered cured. So that's one approach. Um, NBCC is also working on a vaccine um, in terms of prevention. And, and that's another interesting, interesting approach. So that's one good group. Um, we're working hard on you know, trying to find an infectious. So and we'll always take, uh, we always uh, like support. Um, and I think that uh, uh, the other groups tend to be more focused um, in ways like share is or common with support groups, walks. Avon is doing some good, some good stuff as well, um, trying to look outside of the box. They're looking at some infectious agents to try to find prevention, and they're looking, um, uh, but not so much um, uh, treatment, the treatment side. So I, I think that's the that's the, uh, the cliff notes anyway answer to is what's a really hard question. What I'd like to see, and I have a fantasy, I'm, I haven't done this yet, so I have a, as my staff tells me, I have a brilliant idea a second, and I can't do them all. But um, if, if there might be a way we can get all the groups together maybe to pool, uh, do an X prize or something in terms of the cure. So instead of depending on, on the NIH and all the guys that have been doing the same thing over and over again, really put it out there and, and, and put up a prize and see if we couldn't do something that way and just have everybody come together. But that, that'll, that'll take me a year or two. So stay tuned for that idea. But I'm, I'm germinating it. 
So, Dr. Love, someone wanted to let you know that her dad is a 21-year survivor of AML. Great. Good. I'm glad to hear it. Yes. Um, I mean, AML is one of those ones that's pretty aggressive. So if you make it a couple of years, two, three years, you're probably pretty good. <laughs> but I, but, so I'm glad to hear that. Good. So another question here is, um, can you address the effects of radiation on lungs and the heart? Ah, this is another really good question. Um, they're definitely, obviously, behind the breast is the lung. And on the right side, um, uh, the lung, and on the left side is the heart. So um, uh, they, they're going to get some collateral damage. Now, in the old days, I have an aunt who had a, a radical mastectomy um, before when I was probably in high school. Uh, and had cobalt radiation. And uh, she ended up getting, not only having heart disease, but then died of lung cancer, which was caused by the, by the cobalt that was used to treat the breast cancer. Um, now, we're much better, because in those days, we just aimed the radiation machine at you and went, eh, hey, hey, you know, and fried everything in its path. Now, um, they do um, and any of you have had radiation, they know, you know they map you, and they have a computerized simulation, and they put your hand in a certain position, and, they, and all of that is an attempt to try to avoid damaging the lungs and the heart. So the more modern radiation in the last 10, 15 years is causing less collateral damage uh, than the previous radiation when we were not as, as, as we didn't know uh, how much damage, and we didn't have the technology to avoid it. Um, there even are some, some studies, Sylvia Fomente, who's a good friend over at the NYU and is a radiation therapist, says if you, if you get treated laying on your stomach, too, um, for your, as opposed to on your back, you can get less, you're going to catch less lung and less heart um, treatment. So it is important for people who are getting uh, radiation treatment, either after mastectomy or lumpectomy, to um, look at where they're getting it because it, it, it does how carefully it's planned and aimed and all of that makes a difference. And there may be other factors. So the other thing that may be uh, at, that we're really interested in in this collateral damage business is are there things, are there some people who have conditions or genes or whatever that make them more susceptible to the radiation so that you could predict that ahead of time, well, if you had radiation, it would damage your heart and lungs, so maybe you should have a mastectomy and not radiation, whereas, you're, you're, whereas this other person will be fine. So I think, I think there's two ways. One is doing it better. Two is seeing if you could predict who is um, going to be more prone to damage. And so you do want to make sure, though, there's nothing we do that doesn't have side effects. Nothing. So, you know, the surgery has significant side effects. The radiation has significant side effects. The chemo, the hormones, they all have collateral damage. So there's, there's no way you can treat cancer, breast cancer anyway, and not come out of it um, with collateral damage. There are some collateral benefits as well. Somebody wrote to me about they used to have plantar warts and they went away with the chemo. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> you never know. So here's another question about collateral damage. Have you come across anyone reporting, quote, weird skin changes seeming to act like viruses? I don't, I'm not sure what seeming to act like viruses means, but weird skin changes, certainly, either from radiation, um, also from the, you know, the changes, the hormonal changes can also, you know, just going into menopause can cause weird skin changes. Um, there are also can some of this stuff can provoke sort of an autoimmune kind of um, changes as well. But that's a really good one. So I, I advise that person to um, go to question the cure and put it so we can because then we can ask it in the house study because I'll forget with my chemo brain that you even said that. Um, and so we'll that way go to question the cure. There's a text you know the old free text box. Put it in there because then we'll include it. And then we can see how common it is and see, and, and see if we can figure that out. 
So can you comment please on breast MRI versus ordinary mammogram for screening of a 23-year-old survivor, I mean 20, I'm sorry, a 23-year survivor with bilateral implants? Okay, well first let's just talk about the differences between mammogram and MRI and some of these other tests that are coming out. Mammogram is, is um, is an x-ray and it's looking at differences in um, shadows. So the, the, particularly the postmenopausal breast is mostly fat, that's why we start to droop, um, and uh, fat is gray and cancer is white, so um, they're looking for some white, you know, something white in the middle of the gray. That's, it's just a difference in, in, in uh, uh, shadows. Um, MRI focus is a different way. What they do is they give you contrast material that is in your blood and then they're looking at are there any spots in the breast that have an increased blood supply with the idea that a cancer, once it gets beyond a certain size, needs more blood to be able to grow because it needs nutrients and oxygen and all that. So it attracts more blood, blood vessels to grow into it, so it has a higher blood supply, right? So think about if you, if you injure yourself and you get, it gets red and swollen, that has an increased blood supply. So they're looking for hot spots, the MRI. Now, not all cancers have increased blood supply. So they, the, the MRI is good at finding some the cancers that do and not good at finding the cancers that don't. So it's not good at, for DCIS, for example. And things that aren't cancer can have an increased blood supply too, so it's not good for those. So it can have false positives as well. Um, so in general, the if somebody is young, their breasts are still pretty dense. They stick straight out. They don't droop. And then your less mammogram is going to be less accurate because you're not going to be able to see a contrast between a white cancer and white breast tissue. And in that situation, if you're high risk or you're a, a, a survivor, an MRI may be a better choice because it's not dependent on density. Once you're postmenopausal, the addition of MRI is probably not um, that advantageous, particularly somebody who's as, as far out as, as the questioner. Um, there was a, just a study this week, I think I posted it on Facebook, um, but that showed that how much uh, how high the use of MRIs are compared to the recommendations of their use. So every hospital's bought breast MRIs and now they're looking for things to use them for. So doctors are using them or, or, or radiology practices. So they're using them pre-op, which has never been shown to be of any benefit. They're using them, um, um, it, they're definitely beneficial in, in BRCA women or in young women who've had breast cancer or who, who um, are very high risk. But they, but they don't probably have as much benefit in the average person or the survivor who's postmenopausal. Um, uh, they're probably not going to uh, make that much difference. Now, but then you also have the the that the, the mammograms are radiation and the MRIs aren't. So one one has a higher cost to your pocket. The other has a higher cost of damage to your body. <laughs> I don't know. There's not a there's not a right answer. But the key thing to remember. These things are all just the imaging is the it's not the it's not our ability to see into the breast that's the answer. It's really dictated much more by the biology of the tumor. If it's an aggressive tumor, um, it doesn't matter what kind of imaging you have. You're, you're probably not going to see it. And if it's a, if it's a really slow growing tumor, you will see it. And hopefully, you'll catch some of the ones in the middle. So all the imaging is best at finding the better tumors. Okay, so someone's asking about, do you happen to know what the percentage of breast cancer survivors who have complex co clotting as a result of the hmm. cancer and complex clotting as a result of chemo? So I don't, and I'm not totally sure what you mean by complex clotting, but certainly the chemo, as we all know, interferes with your with your bone marrow. So okay, so chemotherapy for any kind of cancer 
no matter what flavor, is just poison. That's all it is. And the idea is you want to poison, you poison cells that are dividing. So it interferes with the mechanism of cell division. And so it's going gonna, it's gonna to poison all cells that are dividing, whether they're your hair or your bone marrow or the cancer cells. So the theory is the cancer cells are dividing fast. We're going to kill them. Um, but we also, in the process, are going to kill the other cells, your hair cells. And your bone marrow is sitting there making red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Platelets are involved in clotting. It's also making um, uh, all the factors that are involved in clotting. So the bone marrow is a factory that's just working all the time. So that's why when you get chemo, you're, they check your blood counts, and, and then sometimes they give you drugs to try to you know, boost up your bone marrow so they'll make more cells. And that's why in the process of, you know, poisoning the bone marrow, it is certainly possible that you can cause mutations in those cells in the bone marrow. And, we, and, and that's where cancer comes from, whether it's leukemia in the white cells, um, there, whether it's something in the platelets, which are the clotting cells, whether it's uh, some dysfunction in the red blood cells. Some people get kinds of uh, really bad anemia. Um, caused by, um, and all of this, because you've mucked with it, with this, you, you know, you did this big tsunami of chemo to the bone marrow, and, and um, the chances, you have a good chance of, of causing problems with that. So um, the exact numbers, I mean, that's exactly, and I, I encourage the questioner, please go to question the cure and put that question there. Um, I'll try to remember, but I have chemo brain, so I can't guarantee you anything. Um, and we'll ask it, and we'll see how common it is, um, because we have now uh, 10,000 survivors in the house study, close to 10,000, and when you all join, it'll be 10,130, and then, um, and, and we'll be able to say how common it is. But right now, you can find papers saying that it happens, but you can't find papers saying that it's 1% versus 30%, or that it happens more in people who have a history of anemia, or it happens more in people, you know, all of those kinds of things, that's exactly what we want to study, and that nobody else is going to study it unless we do. So there are several questions here about um, nutrition and natural cures. So one says there's not much evidence-based research on nutrition, mm -hmm. but I read green tea, pomegranate, mushrooms, turmeric, etc. Is there anywhere you would recommend for the best knowledge? And other people are asking sort of the same thing. How come there are no studies on natural cures? And what's your take on it? So there's two things. So first of all, to get cancer, you need two things. You need mutated cells, and they need to be in an environment that's egging them on. So you get the mutations from ultraviolet light, from radiation, from viruses, from could be from carcinogens in the environment. You could inherit them. Um, and the longer you live, the more mutations you have. It's like dents in your car. The longer you own your car, the more dents you have. But then they've got to be in a local environment, in a local neighborhood, right in the organ that's egging them on, and in a systemic, the whole body egging them on. And that's where things like nutrition seem to have, and other things like exercise and stress reduction, seem to have their biggest effect. So you can, you know, we go back to when I was talking about those dormant cells, the cells asleep, you could potentially, by changing your neighborhood with exercise, diet, and, and you know, uh, stress reduction, you could maybe keep whatever mutated cells you have. You might not be able to reverse the mutation, but you might be able to maintain things asleep. Um, so that's one way that we think some of these things work. Any one particular compound I always distrust as being this is the magic one. If you just eat, right now it's kale, but, you know, actually they just have a new PR firm because kale's no better than spinach, um, in fact. Uh, and it's the usual, most of the nutrition stuff is what you think. It's, it's um, uh, you know, eat a healthy diet, high in fruits and vegetables, low in animal fat, you know, it, there, there's not, there's not like, we keep thinking if we just have one thing, it will all be okay, and there's probably not. 
Um, pomegranate juice was the thing for a while. Now that's out. Um, uh, what is it? Quiona or whatever is now in. But you know, whenever there's something that's that in, it's usually more about PR than it is about research. For example, the blueberries. Remember when blueberries were in? Um, that was a study on pigs, um, and actually it showed that blueberries, raspberries, and and strawberries all worked, but it was funded by the Blueberry Growers of America. So we only heard about blueberries. Um, so I worry about those kinds of studies. However, that doesn't mean that diet isn't important. And there are there is some interesting research. Sarah Sukumar at, at Johns Hopkins, who's a basic scientist, is working on putting turmeric and some of these other compounds into nanoparticles. Because one of the problems is you usually you can give these compounds to mice and affect cancer results, and then they write it up in the paper saying turmeric prevents cancer. But the amount you have to give a mouse is a lot less than the amount you have to give a person. And then when you get to a person, it, it's not absorbed that well, and so you'd have to really eat a shitload of turmeric to get any effects. So she's, they're trying to concentrate it and make capsules. So there, there, is a, there is actually some work going on in this. You're right, though, the majority of, of research is not doing that. Now, one of the other things, kinds of things we're looking at in the house study is things like, you know, we are have a module that will look at diet and exercise and what people are eating. And we will crowdsource and ask people what questions, you know, they want to know what people are eating and see if we can come up with some clues um, about these things. So the ones that sound too good to be true usually are, um, and, and I think and they usually come from a PR firm. But that does not mean that we're not going to find, you know, some answers there. And if you think about it, penicillin was mold. So, you know, and, and, and we do need to encourage people very often if they can't figure out a way to patent it, then they're not going to do the research because they don't see a way to get money. So it's got to be the kind of research that's driven uh, by the public. There's another question here about BRCA, the BRCA gene. So the participant says that she had genetic testing and tested negative for BRCA1 and 2, but extended gene sequencing showed two BRCA2 mutations of unknown significance. She has seven cousins with breast or ovarian cancer, all descendants of the same women, yet all are BRCA negative. So this is what a do great you think they should do? So this is a great question because um, we, we have presented BRCA1 and 2 as if they were, they're the genes, if you don't have them, forget it. And we, because Myriad, until very, very recently, had a lock on the testing because they owned the patent until it, the Supreme Court threw it out just recently, but until then, um, then you were really, when you tested BRCA negative, it only meant you tested BRCA negative by the test that Myriad was doing. And, you know, needless to say, uh, a lot of research is going on in genetics and um, a lot of advances, and so there now are more ways to test. And BRCA1 and 2 are not the only genes involved in breast cancer. There's undoubtedly more. Uh, they're just the only ones that we know how to test for. And that, you know, BRCA stands for breast cancer 1 and breast cancer 2. It's not like a big magical thing. Um, and so a lot of the, some of the families that really have a lot of breast cancer um, probably have some kind of uh, other gene. And some of the, we've recruited for a study, for example, in the Army of Women being done at NYU looking for uh, families where they have a lot of breast cancer and have tested negative and they're doing different kinds of tests. I don't know if that study is still open. But there, are, and Mary Claire King up in Seattle um, now that has, has just published on retesting people similar to this, this woman's story that had tested negative and had a strong family history and finding different kinds of mutations. Now, until you have more people with those mutations, they have to say of unknown significance because they don't, they, they could be just happenstance or they could be connected. So the question is whether, uh, I mean, what I would sort of think is, is there a study or a way she could get the rest of her cousins to all be tested? If everybody had the same mutations, then they stop being of unknown significance. You know, so the way to, the, the thing to do is really 
see, and I might even contact Mary Claire King in Seattle, who's very a lovely woman and researcher in, in BRCA, and she was the discoverer of it actually, but very open to that kind of thing. So I would um, contact her and, and tell her about this story, and she might well be able to test the, everybody else and then see whether, whether you have a particular mutation that indeed is significant. Then if that looks true, then you start getting into that should you have breasts, ovaries, you know, what, what should you do? And that's the other crime. So how do we prevent breast cancer right now? We cut off normal body parts. That's really a crime. Okay, another question. Have we made any progress in understanding the difference between invasive ductal and invasive lobular carcinoma? You know, yes, in the sense that they probably are an artificial designation that initially, when we first started looking at, you know, breast cancers back in the 50s under the microscope, we described how they looked under the microscope. So the ductal kinds of cancer are, look like they're in a duct and they have, and the lobular ones looked more like they were in a lobule, and so that's how we named them. And it, 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 we didn't have any significance of it, we just were describing what we saw. So it's sort of like saying, well, you know, I see people with brown hair and I see people with blonde hair. Um, and then, you, you know, later on we found out that generally speaking the lobulars tend to be more likely to be sensitive to estrogen. So when we started doing estrogen receptor testing in progesterone, we said, aha, the, the, the lobulars tend to be estrogen and progesterone positive, the ductals, there's a whole range of things. And so one of the things that we're sort of struggling with in breast cancer is we never throw anything out. <laughs> so I had a big discussion about staging on a, one of the metastatic Facebook pages recently. And this, it's another example of this, where in the old days, the stage 1, 2, 3, and 4, that was devised to tell surgeons whether it was worth operating on patients. Because if you were stage 4, it wasn't worth doing a radical mastectomy because the woman was going to die. This is before we had chemo or anything. But it was just to decide who was going to make it and who wasn't. And then we figured out, oh, you know, not all cancers aren't the same. There's ductal and lobular. And then we figured out, oh, well, there's ER positive, and there's HER2, and there's the triple negative. And so those are all much better predictors than the original staging. And now we know, you know, now we know that from, from tests that call, they call circulating tumor cells, where they can look in your blood and they can see in almost everybody with breast cancer, there are some cancer cells in the bloodstream if you look hard enough. But most of those people never get metastatic disease, that, clinical metastatic disease, and don't die of it. So when, how do you define stage 4? Do you find it as it used to be you had obvious cancer in another organ, then it became um, you had an abnormal scan, then it became you have abnormal markers, and now, are we going to say it's that you have tumor cells in the bloodstream, even though the majority of people who have tumor cells in the bloodstream are never going to get cancer elsewhere because, you know, just because it gets in the bloodstream doesn't mean it gets to the other organ. It could die on the way or whatever. So we have to be careful about getting too hung up on these old designations. And things like metaplastic breast cancer is another one, or, or we used to talk about uh, cyst uh, adenocystic. And all of those descriptive terms were from the old days. And they really don't predict very well. And now that we have um, ability to look at markers and look at the DNA of tumors, we're much better. So I think, I think it's, it, it, it doesn't help a lot to focus too much on those old descriptive names, which are, are, are uh, sort of passe. Okay, I think um, maybe a couple more questions, and then we'll let you get back to your morning. How, how useful are aromatase inhibitors in helping prevent the recurrence of ER positive, PR positive, HER2 tumor, which recurred one year after treatment? Well, you know, I can't, I can't really um, give you statistics for any kind of individual situation, um, but what you can say is this is where 
this is where we're finding it's more complicated than we thought. So you've got, if it's ERPR positive, it's got receptors for hormones, estrogen, progesterone. So then doing the aromatase inhibitors, which, which change your hormone levels, should have a benefit. Um, and then the question is, is it going to always stay that way? Or, you know, is one patch ERPR positive, another patch is ERPR negative, and, and so then should you add Herceptin? That, so we're in a very interesting time now where we used to think the cancers were just one type and, you know, you, you were chocolate and ice cream and forever, and now we're finding, no, no, it's chocolate with a little vanilla and there's some strawberry and there's a little, you know, it, it's, and if you eat all the chocolate, then the strawberry dominates. So it, it's not as easy to predict as we thought. Um, how this is all going to go. What I, and I, so I can't really answer the question directly for, my, for the person. And she, it sounds like my kind of question, what's going to happen in Dr. Susan Love's re, uh, leukemia case? Um, and I don't know. And I don't know what's going to happen in her case either. However, what I do want to explain is about the aromatase inhibitors, because I think people don't really understand this. So there's two kinds of drugs that we use for, for hormonal treatment. And the thing to know is that when you're premenopausal, all your hormones come from your ovaries in big whooshes every month, which we commonly call the menstrual cycle. Um, and it's a central factory, and it churns them out through the whole body. When, and so if you get a hormone-sensitive cancer in your premenopausal, then you need to do something to block those hormones. And you can block them by taking out the ovaries and stopping the hormonal wishes, but that has its own consequences. Um, you can put them into temporary menopause with drugs um, that, that will put you, that will turn it off but without totally castrating you. Or you can use something like tamoxifen, which doesn't affect the production of hormones, but affects how they interact in the end organs. So um, tamoxifen, I always like to say, is is bisexual because it, it goes both ways. In some organs it acts like estrogen and in some organs it, it blocks estrogen. And it depends a little bit who it's hanging out with. So in the breast it blocks estrogen, in the uterus it acts like estrogen, in the liver it acts like estrogen, and in the bones it acts like estrogen. But it works for the premenopausal women because it can block it in the breast, which is what they want. Once you're postmenopausal women, you don't postmenopausal, you don't stop making hormones. Your adrenal glands and your ovaries make the precursors of estrogen. And in the blood, you have the precursors. And then the estrogen and the progesterone and the testosterone are made in the organs themselves. So the breast makes it with an enzyme called aromatase, as does the bone, as does the brain. So the aromatase inhibitor blocks the final production in the organ. So you, it's not going to work in the young women, but it works in the older women, in the postmenopausal women. So it's going to block those cells, those breast cancer cells that are sensitive, that need estrogen to grow. The only question in, you know, in her situation where you've got um, estrogen positive and HER2 positive is whether all the cells have all three so that the est blocking the estrogen ones will keep everybody asleep or whether blocking the estrogen ones will make some of the HER2 ones pop up, you know, whether they're separate, or how that's all going to work. And the answer is nobody knows. Frustrating. Oh, right. So um, I think we'll, I'll leave you with this one last question. It's difficult to know which breast cancer organization to donate money to. Any suggestions on what to consider or look for to make best use of donated funds? Well, I would, of course, um, at the risk of being a, 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 um, a self-serving, say you should give it to us. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, we're, 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 uh, uh, I think that um, one of the things that we're doing is we're both working on trying to refocus the treatments, and we're also working on trying to find the cause, and we're, we're working with others. And we always try in, our, in the research that we do and in the research that we try to collaborate on is to get other people involved and, and bring other groups together. So in that sense, I think you could probably get more bang for your buck. Now, 
it, that obviously is a bit self-serving. I think what you have to look at is what are the things that you really care about. And, um, and they're, they're, they're not in competition. So some, sometimes what people really care about, and I think it's really important, is giving support to survivors like Cher does, in which case you want to give it to Cher. Or sometimes it's getting, making sure that uh, underserved populations get access to whatever you know, screening for whatever its limitations, whatever we got now, but making sure they get it. In which case, you want to give it to organizations that are going to do that. And actually, Komen is, is pretty good on that. And they are funding Planned Parenthood again um, after their oops. Uh, and, and, you know, sometimes your goal is, um, is uh, looking at could there be, you know, any environmental links to causing breast cancer, in which case, you know, breast cancer action really takes up that aspect. So the question is um, to get them. I think to get the most bang for your buck, and 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 at the, I'm I, being a well socialized girl, I try not to be self serving, but I'm gonna do it anyway. The fact that we're we try to be Switzerland, we'll work with anybody that's really doing good things and moving stuff forward. I think we would be good stewards of your donation. However. Um, I think there are a lot of good organizations, and we do try to collaborate with a, a, as many of them as we can. Excellent. So thank you so much, Dr. Love. It's always a pleasure to hear you speak. We wish you the best of luck. Um, thank you all for participating, and uh, I'm hoping that you might take a little time right at the end of this webinar to complete our survey to let us know how we're doing. You can visit our website, www.sharecancersupport.org, and learn about our upcoming programs, specifically for people that are in the New York area. We have some great programs coming up. Dr. Larry Norton on December 2nd, and a program about lymphedema on December 4th here in New York City. And, and maybe you could put on your website or remind people to sign up to give us their collateral damage. Absolutely. And questinthecure.org and join the Health of Women study. And also a recording of this webinar will be available and you'll be notified when it's ready to be, be viewed so you could send it to your friends and have them sign up as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Love. Thank you. Enjoy your day.